Without wasting any more time, I'd like to introduce the director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, uh, Director Letitia Long. Thanks, Tom. Are we here? Here? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Good morning? Uh, yeah. God, I hope it's afternoon. <laughs> well, it is afternoon. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here. I hope you were able to catch my remarks this morning. Um, we, of course, had the DNI speak, um, and then General Flynn after me. Um, but if you heard me this morning, you heard me talk about a new phase of intelligence, immersion. And this is really where we believe we are headed. The world around us is headed that way, and we need to be doing the same in our arena. And I also said that NGA and GeoInt, we believe, are uniquely positioned to build this new platform for intelligence immersion. And that is, of course, because everything, everyone is somewhere on the Earth at a point in time. And so we provide that geospatial foundation upon which all of the other INTs, if you will, um, or all types of information can be anchored to in that object-based production. So we are very excited about the potential here. Um, we feel that we have made tremendous progress um, on our vision that I rolled out uh, in 2010, and this is really the next natural phase. And with that, happy to take any questions. Yes. Uh, Amy Butler with Aviation Week. Could you talk to us a little bit about um, what is in this proposal to uh, give some relief to the resolution restrictions in terms of getting commercial imagery out? And with the launch of Worldview coming up, do you expect to be able to go to the full, full 31 centimeters? Or will there still be some sort of imposed requirement on Digital Globe? So first of all, the license request from Digital Globe is to go to 25 centimeters. Um, and as you heard Director Clapper say this morning, um, the intelligence community has essentially um, endorsed that request. Has endorsed 25? Yes, ma'am. And that is um, with the interagency for deliberations and consideration amongst the interagency. So I can't tell you what may actually be decided. Um, you know, whether it would go straight to that immediately or be tiered um, over a, a number of years, or if there would be any additional um, restrictions on that today. I mean, you may be aware that the satellites that fly today have a better resolution than 0.5, and in fact the government gets the advantage of that, but of course they can't sell. Um, below the 0.5 without a waiver, and in fact, they do sell to um, some trusted um, agents uh, <laughs> at less than 0.5. Okay. Do you know how quickly that whole interagency process would? I <laughs> wouldn't even begin to to guess how long that's going okay. to take. Thank you. Uh, Colin, Colin. breaking defense. Yes. Um, since Noah owns the licensing process. I'm, I'm a little confused about, uh, obviously the White House will make the decision about the licensing standard, but how do they figure in in the process so, without getting too wonky? It, <laughs> so, I mean, you're absolutely correct. They, they own the process, if you will. And um, what they do when they get any license request you know, for, for any kind of um, remote sensing, they send it out amongst the interagency. Um, for discussion uh, feedback. And many of these requests are um, very basic, if you will, and so they get an immediate response back and then they just issue the license. Um, obviously something such as this, there are a lot of considerations. Commerce is going to weigh in, you know, from a, a commerce perspective. The intelligence community weighs in. The Department of Defense weighs in. The Department of State weighs in. Treasury. I mean, it, it, it really is a whole of government. And so, um, again, I think because there are national security implications, the White House staff is, it, it, it's, 
extremely interested in this. Who, who at the White House is leading the agency <laughs> process, do you know? Um, I think Sharag is, is leading it, so within yeah. space policy. Barry. Um, what was the thinking in the IC community about why it was okay to go to 0.25 when right now or last year it was 0.5? So I really don't want to get into the internal deliberations um, in any amount of detail, but let me kind of give you the, the wave tops. Um, we have um, a, a national security policy directive, uh, the NSPD, that was written you know, over 10 years ago, um, which says that we will uh, um, do everything we can to encourage um, our commercial companies in this arena and if you survey the world in what is going on in the international arena many countries are making progress um, as well Digital Globe which you know, really I, I would say is the remaining US company but there are many who are emerging into this market space and so part of the consideration is certainly not wanting to disadvantage US industry as I talked about getting to that immersive experience and immersion, I think um, it's inevitable that we're going to get to this resolution. And so we <coughs> want our U.S. companies to be able to compete. The other thing that uh, I would say is, now there's a difference obviously between satellite and airborne, but there are no restrictions on airborne imagery. And so there's a lot of imagery being taken all around the world at much lower resolution. Now, of course, the difference is, you know, you can't get into denied areas. And denied areas work both ways. Um, so having satellite resolution um, it, it has really been the, the driving force behind, you know, keeping the, the resolution restrictions where they are. Um, but the other is, Digital Globe is, is faced with um, designing right now for their next generation satellites. So you think it's more of a, a marketing commercial decision as opposed to a strategic decision? Oh no, it's absolutely both. A a absolutely. Yes, sir. Hi, Warren Strobel. We'll work our way out. Um, uh, I'm sorry? Warren Strobel with Warriors. I have a question on a different topic. Both uh, Director Clapper and uh, General Flynn talked about the Russian-Ukraine crisis, and I, that's not an area where the last decade or so the U.S. has invested heavily in analysis and coverage and so forth. And can you talk, obviously, on a classified basis of what NGA has had to do in the last couple of months to refocus on that part of the world? So I will tell you, we are always watching the world. Um, Director Clapper said that one of the most fundamental things that we do in the intelligence community is warn, indications and warning. Um, so we are always keeping that baseline look everywhere in the world, and we continue to focus on that area right now, working with European Command, um, our NATO allies, and that's really about all I can say at this point. You know, Howard, I'll take a trip. Um, can you talk about what uh, GEOINT might be lost if we go to a zero option in Afghanistan? What, what GEOINT might be lost in the region? And then <clears throat> if you could also talk about some of the uh, GEOINT priorities for uh, CENTCOM and for SOCOM. Sure. So I, I just mentioned um, Airborne being you know, a great collector. We do have freedom to maneuver in Afghanistan. There are a lot of Airborne platforms there. And so we have um, you know, really mapped that country. And just because you map it once doesn't mean you don't need to revisit that um, because new things are being built all the time, you know, whether it's structures, roads, um, et cetera. Um, so, so we'll lose, if there are zero troops, there will not be um, our airborne platforms there. However, this is where satellites really come into play. <coughs> and so we will continue to have that eyes on and the ability to see um, what we can see from the satellite perspective. Um, the second part of your question, CENTCOM and SOCOM. 
um, two very demanding customers. And uh, again, I, I said in my remarks, you know, the more they demand, the better we become. And we work very closely with both of those commands, just as we do with all of the combatant commands. We have uh, teams embedded in both of those commands, um, not only here in Tampa, but at uh, many of their components. Um, so we are working very closely with them, delivering um, what they need every single day from a planning through operations perspective. Uh, we are right there beside them. And, and that's really a hallmark of NGA, our customer service, our customer support. We're embedded with them, so we understand their priorities, we understand their needs, and therefore, hopefully, we are anticipating what they need even before they ask for it. Our over 10 years of deploying with both CENTCOM and SOCOM, again, our analysts side by side with the operators from the planning phase through the execution and follow-up phase We've gotten pretty good at anticipating the needs. We're seeing the needs anticipated with SOCOM is that <coughs> the demand signal kind of tapers off or, or at least shifts out of Afghanistan and goes to some other places. A lot of pent up need elsewhere. Where are you seeing some of that? Um, SOCOM, and I expect that Emil McRaven will talk to this, has always had a global footprint and will continue to have a global footprint. So wherever they go, we will too. Wherever they need us, we'll be there. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, Adam Simmons, Project Geospatial. And my question is related to your topic of immersion and, uh, and, and how, how this changes with uh, uh, eyesight and, as, as things all come into fruition here. Um, how will you encourage not just small businesses that are trying to get into the defense industry, but even non traditional uh, uh, commercial technology from, let's say, Silicon Valley to get more involved to really uh, disrupt the traditional defense contractors? So I said a little bit about this, um, but I'm glad you asked so I can elaborate. Um, InQtel, um, which is uh, an entity that was set up by the intelligence community over a decade ago to um, work with um, work with InQtel in investing in companies that can go after some of our hard issues, but then they're still going to be able to take that product and you know market it elsewhere, use it for other things. Um, we have almost quadrupled our investment in InQtel since I've been the director. Um, that's the way, and, mo and many, many of their companies are the startups out of Silicon Valley who have these ideas, who have um, either not traditionally worked in our space or have tried and, and haven't been able to get into our space. So we have found that to be quite helpful. The other is, and I, I didn't mention this this morning, we're setting up an innovation program. Um, one of the things I hear from companies who can't get their foot in the door and from employees who have great ideas is, how do we get our great ideas you know, up there? So June will be Innovation Month at NGA. We will roll out the innovation program with a very loose structure um, on how you get good ideas forward. Uh, the other thing is we've had a real focus on our industry interaction program to um, try and make it much more flexible than it's been in trying to get new ideas and new folks through the door. Thank you, ma'am. And, and one more, if I may, the, uh, it, what was your perspective on Robert Scoble and Israel's uh, presentation today? So I was one of those ones who was kind of on the fence. There are so many things that um, obviously location data and you know gathering information um, about the human can help. I mean they gave some great examples from a health benefit from you know rising folks up out of poverty, safety. Um, I did want to turn my iPhone off at one point in their talk. <laughs> and, and I do think you know there is so much talk about the government's intrusiveness and collecting information that we do need to, to educate the consumer on how much information is being collected on us and about us every single day and give you the ability to opt in or opt out. 
I think that's important. There was another hand who hadn't asked a question. Yes, ma'am. I had another eyesight question. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the progress that you've made in eyesight since the pilot programs originally launched, and also if you could talk about where it intersects with JIE. So, and, uh, could you say it in English. plain English so we actually know what the hell you're talking about? I, I will try, <laughs> and if I veer off, raise your hand. Let me know. So, eyesight. The intelligence community, IT, Information Technology Enterprise, is an initiative to integrate the community, save money, and make us more secure. Those are the three reasons we embarked upon it. First and foremost, intelligence integration, to give us the ability to easily bring our information together. There are a number of components that make up eyesight the common desktop, which NGA and DIA are partnered on. We've delivered 5,000. We're delivering hundreds more every month. Both General Flynn and I talked about this. We're going to get through our two agencies, um, hopefully by the end of this year, and then start working on the rest of the intelligence community. And what that enables, and I think you know, quite simply, is I go to Afghanistan twice a year. Today, when I go there, I've got to go find an NGA computer on an NGA network to get to my email. I ought to be able to go to any top secret <coughs> SCI computer and get to my email, get to my desktop, get to my contacts, my, my, all my apps, you know, all my information. Where it intersects with the Joint Information Environment, JIE, which is the Department's instantiation, Department of Defense instantiation for the secret level network, CIPRNET, and the unclassified level network, NIPRNET, uh, it's the same. Again, today, um, I don't actually have to get to an NGA computer and network, but I got to go through some really you know, a couple of levels of machinations of tunneling through. Um, instead of just being able to use whatever the identifier is going to end up being, a, a, a key fob, a token, you know, a smart card, that once I insert it into whatever the reader is, it knows it's me. Therefore, it knows, again, my desktop, it knows um, all of the information I need, all of the information I should have access to. And again, this is really going to enable the integration of our information so that we can arrive at solutions faster and hopefully better solutions and really is a precursor to us getting to this immersive <coughs> environment. Actually, two questions. Um, the first is, you know, there's been a lot of study at the DOD and I would think in the intelligence community as well on how, if at all, the, the community will operate in a GPS-denied environment, whether it's locally or if there is some sort of larger outage. Um, what, what are you guys doing to enhance that, and how reliant are you on GPS? I mean, to a certain extent, once you have the data, I would think you have data, but you're always collecting more data and getting more data from sources. So can you walk me through that issue for you once you can breathe? Right. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, we are as reliant on GPS at, as anyone is. You know, you personally, when you're trying to use your smartphone to get to a new location, or or the Department of Defense, you know, the warfighter in, in piloting a, a, a plane or a ship. <coughs> Pardon me. To um, precision guided munitions. Do you need a cough drop? I actually have some. No, no, no. Okay. The water's fine. Thank you. <laughs> I've been down going through that myself. Um, <coughs> but as you point out, once we collect the data, we don't have to be in that GPS-enabled environment <coughs> unless we need new data because we've got to know where it is we're collecting and have to have it um, geo-referenced. Having said that, we have developed a number of applications, particularly for our first responder community, 
<laughs> and have enabled them to work in a GPS denied environment. Because think about it, um, and, and this actually happened. We had delivered a number of apps when the tornado went through Missouri two years ago. All the cell phone towers were taken out. There, there was no <coughs> GPS, there was no ability to, to get to. And so we very rapidly, in a matter of days, um, developed a, a, a compass um, that you could build into your, your tablet to enable you to be able to direction find, um, to figure out where you know where you were, what direction you were going, because there weren't any, even any street signs. Right. So we think about that every single day. How do we operate? How, do, what do we need if we do not have GPS? Interesting. So okay. We, and then, we do uh, think about it. My second question was about hyperspectral. I know that you're. <coughs> in a slightly different market. I don't know if that crosses into what you do. But there seems to have been quite an interest, especially after the experiments in Afghanistan and hyperspectral imaging. <coughs> I can only imagine there must be something in space doing this. It's technologies out there. Is there any work being done to overlay hyperspectral data and the geospatial element? So there is work ongoing to overlay all types of information, whether it's um, hyperspectral, multispectral, shortwave IR, medium wave IR, the LIDAR data that, that you referred to, open source information. This is part of the conflation I was talking about, which was one of the challenges I gave to industry. How do you integrate all that different kind of data on the fly? And how do you make sure um, you, you have the best and, and again, putting it together so it makes sense. So we use add open source, add news reports, add handheld you know, photography, I mean, all of that. Um, we use all sources of information. That's where you get the richness. Sir, you had a question? Well, kind of an extension of her uh, GPS question, because I personally have run into it is even scarier is losing connectivity in a disaster. And I know, you know, the, the temporary fix we had was to use GeoPDFs where you couldn't have, but you have to have the foresight to have that downloaded or available. I, can I assume safely that that kind of planning is uh, part of NGA's? Uh, it, it, it absolutely is. I mean, we don't have warning for all disasters, but, but we often do. So you take a hurricane. As the hurricane is, you know, bearing down on the, the East Coast, you know, again, we're embedded with FEMA, just like we're embedded with the combatant commands. You know, we're working with them. We're taking imagery, you know, we're looking at the track um, of what the, what's being predicted. We're taking imagery before so that we're ready. That's all loaded, preloaded on, I mean, FEMA now goes out, everything on tablets. Um, Again, if they lose connectivity, they may not get the latest right at that moment, but they have a whole lot to, to go out with when they get started. So, yes, um, a couple years ago when you were um, at the GO1 show here, I remember you came out with an, an iPad or a tablet for your speech and you talked a lot about apps and app development and moving the development away from M NGA developers to industry developers hoping to have 75 or 80 percent of all the apps being developed by industry. Can you bring us up to date on, on where that is? We didn't reach that goal, but I'm known for putting stretch goals out there, just as I talked about the next phase of intelligence immersion uh, this morning. Um, so we're at about 40 percent uh, being developed by industry. I will tell you what um, slowed us down a little bit was coming up with the compensation model. We knew that was going to be a challenge. We knew it was going to be different. How do you contract for something that you haven't even thought of yet? I mean, kind of like as you see a new app in the app store and you download it and all of a sudden you say, why didn't somebody do this before? Why didn't I think of that? Well, it, it's the same thing as we develop apps for our analysts or our collection managers or even on the business side of the house you don't we're not always contracting for it 
developers come in with their good ideas. And so we've had to go through, and we've actually arrived at very close to a commercial compensation model with the number of downloads and then as it gets rated. And of course, you know, we have to, to work through that. Uh, but, but we have. I mean, it took us a little while to work through that. We have. And so um, we're at about 60-40 now and, and growing. So I, I'm actually quite pleased with where we are. Uh, Ma'am, with your presentation, actually a continuation <coughs> of what you were just talking about. Uh, this morning you talked about the uh, NGAs posting on GitHub with mm -hmm. the open source initiative. And I think that was a really, really important step in not only uh, what Scoble talked about in trying to regain public trust as you're exposing data to the public, but how much more can we see in the future of, of that uh, cross public maybe participating in NGA efforts by the same, the same time you're giving back technology at the same time? Yeah, a lot. I mean, absolutely. We've got the next um, three um, pieces of code that we're about ready to put out there on GitHub. Um, I hope that um, others across the government, as they hear that we're out there and doing it, they'll say, oh, I guess we could do that too. Um, this was part of, uh, you know, it, this was part of the vision that I first rolled out in 2010, user as producer user is helping us with the code. That's how we're going to make it better. That's how we're going to get those great ideas. So put it out there on that open public site and you know, we'll let folks put their good ideas there. We'll take it back. We'll improve it upon that. We'll put it back out there and others will continue to improve it. And I will tell you, probably use it for things that we didn't think about. Is there an office put together to help communicate that effort in terms of if people need help and understanding the, uh, the, the efforts that you are uh, uh, putting, putting on GitHub and, and other sources? So from a specific um, perspective on that particular application, it's our customer experience directed, directorate. Um, writ large, uh, Office of Corporate Communications could, could steer you in the right direction. Thank you, ma'am. Excuse me, ma'am. We'll probably have time for about one more for before two thirty. So. Okay. Okay. So there's a gentleman who hasn't asked a question yet. Apologize for being late. Um, and maybe you covered this. Uh, back to the positioning and, and georeferencing question. I'm just curious. In the private sector, when commercial applications are seeing a lot of indoor positioning, is MG engaging at all with some of that new technology on the floor? Um, in terms of like supporting first responders moving through inner space and mapping it, anything you're doing with that at all? We're not doing anything with first responders. I'm just leave it like that. Since that was short, one last oh, one. Yeah. So um, we've just heard a, heard a briefing from Airbus Defense and Space marketing their new world DIM uh, SAR digital elevation model. Um, digital Globe has put out a, re a release. They've teamed up with someone for SAR products. The, the U.S. government made a stab at some star work, star work a while back, and like Lockheed teamed up with guys, and Northrop teamed up with the Israelis. It, do you think there's going to be an explosion of SAR needs here in the U.S., or is this just a reflection of what's already been happening? I mean, where do you think this market is going? And how much of a customer are you already for the Airbus product? So for, products, the, for, the, for the first part, I think I direct you to Digital Globe, <laughs> who, are, who are doing you know, those market surveys. We certainly use SAR data, okay. and we use it extensively. And um, it, it, you know, I mean, one of the benefits uh, of SAR now, you know, we, the, that's different than the World Dem, which has its own set of benefits, is you know, radar data is all day, all night, all weather. And so it's particularly helpful. At, at different times. What is your primary source of SAR? Um, U.S. government satellites. I am now allowed to say the fact that we have U.S. government satellites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at that point was declassified a few years ago. Yeah. Right. So I, I very much appreciate you all being here. I appreciate your interest in our business and really spreading the word about all of the great work that's being done by NGA and the whole GeoInt enterprise. We really do see GeoInt as the foundation and the driver 
not only for intelligence integration, but to get us to this next phase of immersive intelligence. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.